My name is Mike Cohn. We're going to talk about uh, Scrum this morning. This being a uh, Norwegian Developers Conference, being the Agile Day at the conference, um, I wanted to start out the first session that I'm doing at least today with uh, just kind of generic Agile. What is Agile? What's the, what's the most popular Agile process, most prevalent Agile process? And uh, go over that, hopefully laying a good foundation for a lot of the, uh, the deeper topics this afternoon that you may uh, be taking from me uh, uh, Mary, Craig, or Kevlin as we go through the day. Um, I do like to do it fairly interactive, so if you have questions, let me know. You may have to jump up and down because all I see are a couple of bright lights right now. Um, trying to move around, the only place I can get away from is kind of in a corner. But uh, So uh, signal me if you've got a question. I do like to take questions as we go. So uh, with that, let's jump in. One of the things that I like about Scrum is that it's old. Scrum's been around a long time. Here's an article, uh, or a reference from an article back in 1986. This was the very first article to talk about Scrum. This was in the uh, Harvard Business Review, put out by Harvard University, one of the more popular business journals in the U.S. Article written by a couple of very well-respected Japanese researchers. Both have gone on to uh, have very successful careers. One's a dean of a business school in Tokyo. In this article, they, uh, they wrote about what they observed working well for development. And I pulled out one quote that I liked from this article, and it says, the relay race approach to product development, relay race approach, we probably use the term waterfall more these days. So they say the waterfall approach to product development may conflict with the goals of maximum speed and flexibility. And they say instead what we want is a holistic or rugby approach. So here's where the name Scrum is kind of coming into things. We want a rugby approach where the team tries to go the distance as a unit, passing the ball back and forth. And they say that that may better serve today's competitive requirements. Now, I pulled this quote out of that article because I, I found a couple of things interesting about this quote, and it does set up this context for why we call Scrum Scrum. And right, what is Scrum? So a couple of things that I found interesting here. Maximum speed and flexibility. Right up front, the original authors about Scrum told us when it's most useful when we're after speed and flexibility. All right there, it sounds like a pretty good fit for software development. That's normally why we're doing software development is we're after speed and flexibility. I like that this talks about the team trying to go the distance as a unit, passing the ball back and forth. That's what we're after with the, uh, the scrum metaphor here. I'm not much of a rugby player. I played uh, one day in college. We used to play American football every Saturday in our dorm. And uh, one of the guys in the dorm was from London, and he said, uh, let's play a real sport. Let's play rugby one day. And he had us play rugby. It was a much tougher sport than football. Uh, but I don't know that he gave us all the right rules, because one of the rules had to do with a mandatory beer break every five minutes. <laughs> not sure if that's an official rule in the, in the rule book or not. But it is? OK. I have heard that from rugby players, that it's a pretty close to official rule. And it had to do with uh, the scrum in rugby had to do with some of the bigger guys on the team putting their arms around each other, pushing against the big guys on the other team. Other guys were behind. The ball was put in the middle, and we're pushing against each other. And it was this idea of trying to move the ball downfield as a unit. So the metaphor comes from this concept of the team sticking together rather than like in so many other sports where it's like, you go over there and I'll kick you the ball, or you go over there and I'll throw you the ball. And it wasn't that type of orchestrated play. It was about the team moving as a unit. I like that this talked about may better serve today's competitive requirements. Yet look at the date, 1986. If this didn't work in 86, there's no way it works now. Right? If we couldn't do relay race or waterfall type development effectively in 86, if it was too slow then, it's definitely too slow now. Think about the pace of the world today compared to 86, those who are working in 86 whole lot faster today than it was in 86. Sticking with the origins of Scrum, Scrum really got going in uh, 1993. That 1986 article just kind of talked about it, laid out some foundations. There was a book that came out in 1990 called Wicked Problems, Righteous Solutions. I don't have that listed up here. I do have it later. We'll have a reference to it. And it said, this Scrum process sounds neat. Wouldn't it be nice if somebody tried this on software? Well, Jeff Sutherland saw that, and Jeff decided, yeah, it would work well for software. So Jeff started it at ESO Corporation in 1993, brought Ken Schwaber in as a consultant. Ken started working on that project. They uh, then documented their work at the Oops Law Conference in 1996. 
Um, I got started doing this in um, October of 1994. It was my first Scrum project, so I've got quite a bit of experience with it by now. A um, few other things and a couple of books listed up there on Scrum. By the way, I don't know if they give you the slides as part of the conference. They're all up on my website. So if you want the slides afterwards, all of this type of stuff is up on my website, which is mountaingoatsoftware.com. <coughs> this is just a list of some of the companies. I just was, wanted to make a, a quickie list of companies that have used Scrum. And I'm not going to go over this. Um, but these were ones that I'd worked with. Um, Scrum's been used in a lot of different places, lots of different companies. Scrum's also been used by all different types of project teams. We've used it, of course, on commercial software. We've used it in contract development. It's been used in medically regulated environments. Um, been used for um, large applications down to small applications. I've uh, worked with companies building uh, things on the iPhone, for example, up to uh, companies with over 1,000 people on their project. So all sorts of application domains, all sorts of types of projects. And again, if we go back to that initial statement, that initial slide, where it said we're after maximum speed and flexibility, well, we're after maximum speed and flexibility in most applications. Even things like the ones up here I've got listed, ISO 9001 certified applications, where safety is, is more important, well, we still want a lot of speed and flexibility. Safety is critical, but we're still trying to do this thing as fast as we can. So we do find Scrum having a pretty wide sweet spot, types of companies and types of applications. Let's talk about what it is. One of the things that's fundamental to me about Scrum is that it relies on self-organizing teams. Self-organizing team is a team that is told what to go build. We need a word processor. We need a website that does this. They're told what it is they need. They're then turned loose towards that goal, though and they figure out how to achieve the goal. Uh, it's not the, uh, the company assigning, why don't you code this, why don't you design this part? People will have job titles and such still, but they'll go beyond those, they'll work beyond those. And the real idea here is that the team is the smartest thing we have, so let's let the team figure out how to solve the problem that they've been given. On Scrum, we work in sprints. Other processes would simply just call these iterations. In Scrum, we call them sprints. Um, and a sprint and iteration are really the same thing. Don't make the mistake that one of my clients made where they use them in different ways. They use sprint and iteration in different ways. I was visiting these guys. My first trip down there, they were in Florida, visiting them. And we're in a meeting, and somebody would talk about doing this and that in a sprint. And a little bit later, somebody would talk about an iteration. And I figured that's fine. They're just using the words interchangeably. And later, it's about two hours later, somebody says, well, we do this when we're in a sprint, but of course it's completely different when we're in an iteration. And I said, what, what, what? I said, I thought sprint and iteration meant the same thing here. And they said, oh, no, they're completely different. And they said, a sprint is when we're working overtime, <laughs> and an iteration is when we're working at a sustainable pace. That's, that, there's a logic to that, right? That might actually make sense. And I said, oh, but okay. I can see why you might have a couple of different rules. I said, what are you in now? She said, oh, we're in a sprint. And I said, how long have you been doing sprints without iterations? How long have you been in overtime mode? And she said, nine months. <laughs> I, if you're doing it for nine straight months, I don't think we should have much of a difference between the two. So sprint and iteration, the way I use them, the way most everybody does, meant to be fairly interchangeable. Scrum is going to collect its requirements in something we call a product backlog. I'll show you an example of this here shortly, but a product backlog. This is really um, what, what other teams will call a prioritized features list. It is prioritized. It's meant to be sorted in the order of uh, the most important down to the least. And it's a features list. It's a list of things that we want in the software. It's not a list of tasks. It's a list of features. One of the things I like about Scrum, no specific engineering practices are prescribed. Uh, we don't tell teams you have to do this, you have to do this. I read a criticism of Scrum one time where it says that Scrum doesn't even require teams to use version control. Right? What a horrible process this is. It doesn't even require you to use version control. Well, I read that and think, wow, what a powerful process this is. It focuses on just the essentials and trusts teams to figure out the right things for them. Right? Should you use version control? Probably, almost certainly. Is there a team in the world that may not? I 
guess there might be some one-person team somewhere doing something so unimportant they don't bother, right? But I find it very inconsistent for a process to say, we trust you, we empower you, solve the problem. Here's a business challenge, and you have to pair program and use version control and write tests first and do all these other little things. All of those are great things. I want teams to do all those things. But I find it inconsistent when a process says, we trust you, we empower you, solve the problem. Here's a list of 408 things you have to do. It's inconsistent. So Scrum wants you to have excellent engineering practices, but we don't prescribe what they are within Scrum. If we were to make a list of the Scrum rules, it would be very short. There's not a lot of Scrum rules. There are things like, you've got to get together and talk once a day. At the end of a sprint, you have to demonstrate some forward progress, some form of potentially shippable forward progress. Scrum has a very short list of rules, but the rules it does have are what we call generative rules, rules that are there to generate the behavior that we want. Things like we found that talking together once a day, just getting together for a quick conversation with your coworkers, very powerful way to keep things moving forward. So the Scrum rules, very short, but meant to generate behavior. Scrum is one of the agile processes, agile day today. It's an agile process. The way I think about those is I think of um, agile as like the term umbrella, or it's like the term refrigerator. It's an umbrella term. I might go to the store. My refrigerator breaks at home. I go to the refrigerator store, and I walk home with a specific brand of refrigerator. I don't know what brands you guys sell over here for refrigerators, right? But I go to the refrigerator store, and I leave with a particular brand of refrigerator. I might go to the agile store and leave with the brand Scrum, right? There's other Agile processes. So Agile is an umbrella term that encompasses Scrum as well as some other processes. Now, where Scrum is going to be most useful for us when you're trying to find out, does this work for our project? Will this fit what we need to do? One of the ways to think about it is about the complexity level of your project and the uncertainty level on your project. Ken Schwaber, in one of his books, applied a diagram created by Ralph Stacey, who's a, a complexity scientist and professor over in London, and Ken adapted the Stacey diagram in this way. He shows to think about our technology on the horizontal axis here. Are we close to certain about this technology or far from certain? Basically, the certainty is about how it works and how we're going to use it. Maybe you were here yesterday listening to some great Microsoft talks, and you learn something completely new, and you're going to go do your first application with that technology. A lot of others here have used that technology before, but for you, it's fairly new. You're fairly far over onto the right at that point. Maybe I've never done anything in Silverlight. Maybe I was here yesterday and I got inspired to go do a Silverlight application. They put, put me pretty far over on the uncertain axis there. In the vertical, we've got how we agree, how well we agree about requirements. Do we think we know what we're going to build, or do we really have a solid idea? We know what this thing's going to be. We've thought about it fairly well. So if you map your project across these two axes, we end up with a couple of different uh, possible ranges here. If you're way out on the right, way up at the top, in the anarchy region, we're doing something for the first time with this technology, and we're not really sure what we're going to build. We've got a, just a three-line vision statement. That project is going to struggle. They're in the anarchy region. Too much churn and uncertainty on that type of project. Best thing to do there, not necessarily to use Scrum, but to move in on one of those dimensions. Go to a smaller project. Make sure you understand the technology. Or here's a project where you might want to invest a little bit in a little bit more requirements analysis up front. Let's really figure out what it is we build before we dive in too hard. Down here in the simple, we know exactly what we're building. We're doing it with uh, Java servlets yet again. I'm going to write my 10,000th Java servlet. All right, well, I know what I'm doing. That's in the simple category. Scrum can still benefit us there, but it's not going to be a kind of an obvious uh, fit. Scrum is mostly going to fit in the complex and complicated regions, which most of our applications are going to be in there anyway. So Scrum turns out to be a good fit there. Now, let's see what Scrum is. Scrum starts out with something called a product backlog. This is the prioritized features list. I've shown it over here on the left. Now, suppose that we're uh, building an e-commerce website, or maybe we're Amazon.com back in their early days. We've got a list of features that we want to add to our website. We'd like to add the ability to return items. I can't return a purchased item. I want to be able to gift wrap. 
I like to buy gifts online. It saves me going to stores, but I hate gift wrapping. So I really want Amazon to add that. And I like to be able to cancel an order. It hasn't shipped yet. I'm just going to cancel it and buy it locally. So we've got a product backlog prioritized by someone we call a product owner, list of features that we want. Our scrum teams are going to make progress in a series of sprints. That's what I described earlier, sprints or iterations. And these are typically two to four weeks. I don't want you to bounce around. I want you to figure out what length you like best. Typically two weeks to four weeks, somewhere in that range. At the start of a sprint, the team grabs some amount of work and commits to doing this. I'm only going to grab one task, one item off of the backlog. I'm just going to take the first one. In real life, a team would probably grab more than one item. But the point is that a team grabs some amount of work, commits to it, and says that by the end of the sprint, they'll be done with that. So by the end of this sprint, we will have added the ability to return items on our Amazon.com uh, store. In order to figure out how much they can commit to, the team has to think about that work in a bit more detail. So the team looks at return and they think about what's necessary and they think, well, we're going to have to make some changes to the middle tier. We're going to have to code this new screen. We're going to design that and get some uh, user feedback on it. They create what's called a sprint backlog, which is a list of tasks that are necessary in order to complete some product backlog work. Right? So I want to be careful here. We've overloaded the word backlog. We've got product backlog, list of features, and we've got sprint backlog, list of tasks. So two different types of backlog going on. One, a set of features, one kind of the team's private to-do list, a series of tasks in that case instead. Now at the end of the sprint, we'd like to come out with what's known as a potentially shippable product increment, some incremental improvement to our software. Right? You might think of this as basically working software. All we're really trying to do with Scrum is bring the application back to what's called a zero defect milestone at the end of a sprint. These got popular in the 90s. We had a lot of uh, people writing about what were called ZD milestones. ZD milestones are zero defect milestones. Trying to bring the application to a shippable state at the end of the sprint. Now I know if we're doing a large application, we're not going to ship this thing every sprint, but I'd like to have it well tested and ready that if we wanted to, we could. So that's the goal during the sprint, is to get to that potentially shippable state. And one of the things that really appealed to me early on with Scrum was how Scrum has essentially a two-faced approach to change. Scrum says no change during the sprint, but anything can change outside the sprint. So while our team is kind of locked away during a sprint working on returning items, our product owner or somebody in the company comes up with the idea that we should accept coupons on our site. Hey, wouldn't it be nice if we could have 10% off coupons, 100 kroner off coupons? Let's add a story to do that. Let's add a feature to do that. So we add an item called coupons. Product owner is responsible for prioritizing that product backlog, and our product owner puts coupons in where it belongs. When the team then finishes their sprint, returns is done, it's added into the product, the team surfaces and says, what's next? They look at the product backlog and they'll see cancel. Okay, we've seen that one before. What's next? Coupons. Oh, that's a new one. Tell us more about that. Right? And so the team is isolated from change during the sprint, and we allow the whole world to change outside the sprint. This lets the team focus. This was a big benefit uh, for me, I, was, I had just by nature of the projects I'd worked on before I encountered Scrum, I had seen this type of problem of the team being redirected just wreak havoc on projects. This is a big appeal to me that we can isolate the team, let them focus on what they've selected, meanwhile the whole world can change outside. Now I want to add one element here. At the top of this picture, I'm going to add what we call daily stand-up or daily Scrum meeting. The daily Scrum meeting is a misunderstood meeting. People think it's like a status meeting. This is really just a chance for the team to synchronize their work. The team comes together and they talk about what each other are working on. It's a synchronization meeting more than anything else. Okay. Let's dive into some of the parts of this specifically. Sprints, two to four weeks. Don't bounce around. When I started doing Scrum back in 94, the first thing we did every sprint was we would decide, should we do a two, a four, or a six-week sprint. And we'd bounce around between those links. I found out later when we had a team that uh, just kind of kept a constant uh, four-week sprint in, that, in their case, found out the teams do better for when they have a regular cadence, 
regular rhythm, every four weeks, every two weeks, whatever you choose that works for you, having some sort of cadence is going to work better than bouncing around. Right? Now, once you start doing scrum, all that's left are sprints. Sprints, one ends, the next starts. Meaning that all the questions about does this happen in a sprint, does this happen outside a sprint, all those questions go away because all we have are sprints. Everything happens inside the sprint. So all design code, testing, architecture, whatever it may be, all happens inside of a sprint. Now, within the sprint, what I'd like the team to do is to overlap their work. We want to avoid having something like the top, where we're showing requirements being done and then handed off to a designer, the designer hands it off to a coder and then to a tester. Not a very efficient way of working. And this is what we saw uh, we had in that initial slide where I was quoting the Harvard Business Review. This is the relay race approach or the waterfall approach. What we want instead is to overlap work. So I've got the work overlapping down here at the bottom. Now, I'm not so naive to think it's going to overlap 100%, but the greater that we can overlap the work, the better we're going to be. Let me give an example of what we might mean with this. A lot of times people think that testing and programming have a finish to start relationship, meaning I can't start testing until I finish programming. And that's not true. Testing and programming can be overlapped. It's a little bit harder. Teams have to shift some of their thinking. But programming and testing absolutely can be overlapped. What they have is what's called a finish to finish relationship, meaning that testing cannot finish until coding has finished. Right? I have to be done programming it before I can say I'm done testing it. But those can finish at essentially the same time or very nearly the same time. It doesn't have to be the case that, that testing starts only after programming finishes. And this is a common challenge for new Scrum teams, getting used to new ways of working and finding ways to overlap that work. Right? Big part of the power once they figure this out, but definitely hard to start with. Now, I've said no changes during a sprint. Right? No changes during a sprint. That often uh, kind of causes some concern because people will be thinking, well, how would that work? You know, in my business, the, the environment is so dynamic. We're thinking of new things. And there's new interruptions. And what do I do if the server goes down and the team uh, needs to, to reboot the server or to patch a, an application on the website? What are we going to do? No changes allowed. Well... What we're after here are the type of changes that, that slow teams down. We're after the type of change where we have that product owner or key stakeholder who comes to the team and says, I changed my mind, now I want this. Right? Or I've thought a little bit more about it and I really want you to do this instead. Or this phone call with a client yesterday, now I want this. We're trying to keep those type of changes out. We're not trying to keep out emergencies. Teams do need to plan to have some ability to accommodate emergency situations, things like that. We're really trying to keep out the changes that could have been predicted. I leave some of that out, let the team focus. Okay. Let's talk about three parts of Scrum. I want to talk about the, in terms of thinking about it as a framework, there's really roles, ceremonies, and activities. And I've mentioned some of these roles, so let's start with the roles to start with here. The first of the three roles on a Scrum project is someone called the product owner. Product owner is really the uh, kind of the key stakeholder on the project. This is the person who defines what it is we're going to build and makes the trade-off decisions, kind of the second bullet point there, the trade-off decisions about when should we release versus how much should be in there. Product owner might be sitting around today thinking, uh, yeah, you know, early August is looking good for a release. Maybe we should come out in early August with this product. Or, you know, maybe let's come out in September. Let's put a whole other month's worth of features. Our competitor hasn't released yet. And, you know, it is a bit of a hassle to upgrade our software. Let's go one more month. Let's go until September instead of August, adding more functionality. So the product owner is the person who figures out the features we're going to build. It's making trade-off decisions. This makes the person the one who's responsible for the profitability of the product. This is the person that we look to to make sure that our project is earning back the investment, is making us money, whatever it is that we're doing this that justifies it on an economic sense, product owner is the one responsible for that. So they're expected to know how to prioritize, they're expected to be able to adjust that every sprint. 
I hate how that bottom bullet point is phrased, and one of these days I'll figure out a way to reword that, make it sound a little bit better. But the product owner does do this. They do accept or reject the work product of the team during the sprint. What we're after here is for the team to build some software. At the end of the sprint, they show it to their product owner. The product owner looks at it and says, yeah, we're done. I like how that looks. I accept that we're done with that. Or the product owner looks at it and says, yeah, I see how you built that. I see how you interpreted what I want. But that's not quite right. Now that I see it or now that I see these three features work together, I don't like it. Let's make a couple of changes here. So the product owner does, at the end of a sprint, accept or reject what the team has done. But I hate how this sounds like the product owner is kind of sitting in their throne and the team comes up and says, what do you think, almighty oh, product owner? That's not, the, that's not the relationship that we're after. I want the product owner involved during the sprint. I think the way to think about this is all the advice that I was given Early on in my career, as I started to work my way up in my career, and I was given advice about writing annual reviews. I had a boss who had, gave me my first management responsibility and said, okay, end of the year, you're going to have to write reviews. And one of the bits of advice, and this is common, almost everybody gets something like this, nothing in the annual review should be a surprise. Right? If you're going to tell the person they're a horrible communicator, you should have been giving them that feedback through the year, right? You know, anything like that would be a big surprise during the annual review or periodic review. Same type of thing here. I don't want the product owner's opinion about what the team has done to be a surprise. The product owner should be engaged during the sprint, should be looking at things during the sprint, and so it shouldn't be a surprise if the work is rejected. I right? shouldn't be surprised if it's accepted either. The team should know what's coming, meaning the team should work during the sprint with the product owner to make sure nothing does get rejected at the end. We're talking constantly during the sprint. This won't happen. Okay. Second role we've got in the uh, scrum process is somebody called the scrum master. Scrum master is the person responsible for helping the team do scrum, helping the team go as fast as they could for removing obstacles to the, team prog the team's progress. I had these little icons drawn up uh, oh, about, a, about two years ago, I guess now. Um, I, I needed some work done on one of my websites, and I happened to come across this uh, good artist. He's down in Amsterdam, and I asked him to, to work up some art for me. He doesn't know anything about Scrum. He'd never heard of it until I started describing it to him. And I described what the product owner does, and he drew this little product owner icon. And, um, you know, the, I wish he never came. I tried to get a more gender-neutral one here, but we couldn't come up with a more gender-neutral product owner. And when I asked him to draw the Scrum Master one, he came back with the Scrum Master dressed in a referee's outfit, kind of the black and white stripes. And I like that. You know, I said, okay, yeah, you got it. You know, this is the essence of the Scrum Master. I like this. This works. And I started to think about it and decided, no, that didn't work. The Scrum Master isn't really the referee. The Scrum Master, you know, referee gets to kick you out, right? You're out of the game, right? Pull a red card. And the Scrum Master doesn't really get to do that. So we had him redraw the Scrum Master more as a coach. It's hard to know this guy's a coach rather than a player, except, I guess, other than the C. On, uh, on the uniform, but this person's meant to look like a coach here rather than the referee idea. The idea being that the coach helps you as the team do the best you can, helps you learn the sport or know where you're, uh, where you're missing things. The, um, the way I think of the relationship here is that the scrum master helps the team be prepared to go as fast as they can. He makes them the best team that they can be. But it's the product owner that aims the team at the right goal. So the product owner gets the team aimed. The scrum master gets the team moving as fast as possible. If one of those is missing, you're in a bit of trouble. You might be aimed at the right goal, but going slowly. Or you might be going very quickly, but at the wrong goal. Neither of those sounds very good. Third role that we think about on a scrum project is the team, everybody else. Now, the typical team size, five to nine people before you leave, before you get up and walk out because you've got a 10-person team. That's just a guideline, right? I like instead how Amazon talks about their, their Agile teams, their Scrum teams. Amazon says, we want to staff two pizza teams. They want to staff a team they can feed with two pizzas. I, I like that much better than putting a hard number on there. So think about having a two-pizza team, which, by the way, is me and a small testers kind of... <laughs> Kind of my view on that. 
As silly as that is, I actually think that's a great way to think about it. If it's gotten to the point with your team where you've got a few too many people and it's hard to order lunch, your team might be too big, right? If you got five or nine people, it's pretty easy to remember who's vegetarian and uh, you know who's uh, gluten-free and all those type of things. It's easy to remember that type of stuff and to think about how much food to have there, right? If you got a 14, 18, 19 person team, too hard, right? The team is meant to be cross-functional. This is back to that initial use of the, the term, right? Remember scrum, the big guys with their arms around each other, pushing the ball downfield, right? Cross-functional. Now, I want to tell you a story about cross-functional teams. I was reading an interview with Steve Jobs of Apple Computer a little bit ago, and Steve was asked, how does Apple so consistently innovate great products? How do you guys constantly innovate great products? And his, his answer was interesting. He answered in the form of a story. He said, think about a car company. Think about somebody like Ford Motor Company. He said, Ford comes out with a new car. It's just a design. It's not a real car yet. They come out with a design, and they show it off at one of the car shows. Let's say the Milan car show. So you go to Milan, and you look at this car. Oh, this is beautiful. Right? And Ford takes that feedback back to their their factory back in Michigan, and they tell the engineers, build this car. Everybody loved it. Everybody loved this design. They thought it was beautiful. And the engineers look at it and go, well, obviously it is. This car is fantastic. Won't handle, but it's beautiful. And the engineers say, we're going to have to make a few changes. We're going to have to extend the wheelbase of the car. We're going to have to change the rake of the windshield, the angle of the windshield. And the engineers apply some compromises to the car. The engineers are done. They hand it off to the finance people. The finance people look at it and say, beautiful car, well engineered. Can't sell it for a profit, though. We need to reuse some parts. Why don't you slap on the doors from this other car? Right. The engineers redesign it, the re re-engineer it, the designers redesign it. Car comes out, takes four to six years. The car eventually comes out. You see it four years later at the Milan car show, and you look at it and go, I recognize it, but I don't want this one. Where's that nice one you showed me earlier? Right? And so Jobs continues and says, why design a car you can't engineer? Why engineer a car you can't sell at a profit? Right? His, his point with this is about cross-functional teams. Right? He says, if we were coming out with a new product at Apple, we would have a hardware designer working with a software designer, working with um, a programmer, working with a finance person. Right? We'd have all those people working together to figure some of this out. So that's what we're after with this cross-functional team. You know, I hate this third bullet point up there. Members should be full-time. Imagine instead that we're here at the end of Norwegian Developers Conference for Waterfall Day. Not Agile Day. We're here for Waterfall Day. And everybody's telling you about the wonderful waterfall process. I'd still have that third bullet point up there. Hey, waterfall process works best when everybody's full-time. Right, so I, you know, and I didn't, you know, I didn't make that deliberately, thinking I was cheating or something. I'm just like, you know, what's important on a scrum team? Well, full time people's important. And then later, after a couple of years of training, that I realized, you know what? No matter what process I was saying, I'd still want to put members or full time up there. So what I think about this with Agile is that Agile and Scrum in particular help us point out the cost of having non full time members. Right now, I don't mind if somebody's on two teams. I can live with that. I'm more concerned here when we get the person who's on five or six teams, right? And I met this one, uh, this one, he was a database director. He's in charge of the database group. And he had a nice spreadsheet. He had a list of projects down the side of his spreadsheet, a bunch of projects, maybe 18, 19 projects. And then he had his people in columns across the spreadsheet. And I think there were seven people. So seven projects, eight, seven people, 18, 19 projects. And he had a matrix there mapping people to projects down to the 5% level, right? And he had the typical person on five or six projects. And they were on some projects, spent 5% of your time on this, spend 15% of your time on this, right? No way, right? I mean, you know what those individuals did. They worked on whatever they were being yelled at the most about. Right? Somebody screamed, they'd go work on that. They weren't going out and proactively allocating 5% of their time and 15% of their time. Right? Teams are self-organizing. Right? We don't really have a lead programmer role on Scrum. We don't have a lead programmer who says, you code this. We don't have those type of things. 
Teams figure it out. Now, if a team says, hey, you've been here the longest. Why don't you make uh, some of the decisions? That's OK. That's still self-organizing. Right? But the, it's up to the team to figure that out. Right? So there's the team. Let's look at the ceremonies. We've got four standard meetings on a Scrum project. So let's look at what those are all about. First one is called the planning meeting, sprint planning meeting. This is the long, obnoxious meeting. We've got four meetings in Scrum, and some people say Scrum teams meet too much. It's like, well, if you're doing it wrong, it might feel that way. If you're doing Scrum correctly, it shouldn't feel like too many meetings, because three of them are very, very short. This one, long and painful. So let's look at this one for a moment. This happens at the start of a sprint, first day of a sprint. Everybody on the team comes together, and they figure out what they're going to do kind of split into two parts. The first part, I call this the prioritization part of the meeting, they talk about the backlog. They ask questions. They say, hey, product owner, we see this item on here about um, uh, coupons, these 100 kroner off coupons. Tell us more about this. So this is the team's opportunity to discuss with their product owner about the backlog. What are we going to be building? And they're really trying to figure out what their goal is for the sprint. Our goal is this, and they're going to go after features like, uh, you know, maybe it's money-saving features, right? That'll get more customers in, features that will save customers money, right? Coupons, better shipping rates, things like that. That part of the meeting's over. The team goes into a second part of the meeting. This is the longer part of the meeting. During the second part of the meeting, the team is focused on what do we have to do to achieve that goal? And they talk about what tasks are necessary. OK, we've got to code this. We've got to design this. We're going to have to test this. And so they create the sprint backlog, that list of tasks. So the second half of the meeting is all about tasks, how long those tasks are going to take. They estimate it in hours. And they come out with something called the sprint backlog. Sprint backlog, team's private to-do list. Here's what we have to do this sprint. Right? It's just a list of tasks that are used to achieve the goal that the team has selected. Now I want to show you a little bit more on sprint planning, show you an example here. The idea is that the team looks at features that may be on the product backlog, such as this bottom one. Say we're working on a travel site. As a vacation planner, I want to see photos of the hotel rooms. I'm trying to figure out which hotel I should stay at. Some photos would help me. So the team has that as a feature. They break that down into tasks and hours, as shown on the right over there code the middle tier, code the user interface, and then parentheses, those hour estimates for those. So during this, the team is doing high-level design discussion. I'd like to think that this stops a little short of getting up and drawing UML on the wall, but the team is talking through the design. How should we do this? Should we do this in that module? You know, should we finally take the time to clean up this one block of code? We've got this one bit of code. We said we'd fix it. Should we do that now? Should we do this in the database instead? So we call this the sprint planning meeting, but I really think of three things is happening in this meeting. Planning, we're absolutely, we're talking about tasks, estimates, hours, that is planning. We're also talking about technical design. Should we do this in the database? Should we do this here? Technical design. Third, though, product design. Should it be like this? Should we do the fancy version? Should we do a simplified version? How will this fit with this other feature? So three things, planning, technical design, product design, all happening in that meeting. That's why it takes a long time. People will criticize Scrum and say, oh, it doesn't allow time for, for planning, doesn't allow time for design. Uh, well, it absolutely does, and this is the beginning of it. Design is not relegated that it has to happen in this meeting, but this is where it starts. Okay? So sprint planning meeting. First of the four meetings, the longest, in some ways the most important. This is one that sets the tone for the rest of the sprint. Second meeting that Scrum teams do the daily scrum. And teams will do this one every day. They'll get together briefly 15 minutes. This is a very strictly time boxed meeting. Right? The meeting starts on time and it is over in 15 minutes. A lot of teams do things like make people pay a small fine. Right? Toss in five kroner if you're late, something like that. You have to pay a fine if you're late. I'm not necessarily in favor of that rule. I'm just saying it's a common one. Uh, it is a stand up meeting. Most teams find this more beneficial to stand up. Right? I'm willing to bet that I'm less comfortable than you are right now. I'm standing, you're sitting. They don't look like the most comfortable seats in the world, but you know, you're at least sitting down. 
Right? I get calls or emails. I get emails like this all the time. Um, I'll have trained a class or something at a company, and I'll get an email a year later, tell me all about how Scrum's going for them, and they'll say, but we're having problems with our daily Scrum, and they'll go on and on and on. All I have to do is email back, stand up. All right? They've started sitting down, and now the meeting takes 25 minutes instead of 15. All right? So we do this as a stand-up meeting. It is not meant to be a problem-solving meeting. Right? It's meant to be a brief synchronization meeting. Now, I'm going to make the claim that I bet most of you have done a daily Scrum. Even those of you who have never done Scrum before, I bet many of you have done daily Scrums. Here's why I think that. You were on a project sometime in the past, and it was on schedule. It was going to finish on time. You've got three weeks to go. We're going to make it. We're going to finish on time. Well, we're going to finish on time as long as nothing goes wrong. As long as nothing kind of falls through the cracks or slips through, we're going to make it. Somebody on that project comes up with the good idea of, let's get together after lunch. Every day, let's just get together for five or ten minutes after lunch. Let's do it in my cubicle or outside the boss's office, and we'll just talk about how things are going. And you do that for the last two or three weeks of the project. It does help prevent anything from falling through the cracks or being forgotten. And it works very well. It's an energizing meeting. You leave it kind of excited about what you're doing and the progress others are made. Great idea, great thing to do. Project then ships, and you stop doing that great thing. Well, on Scrum, we acknowledge, hey, this is a good thing. Let's keep doing this, this brief opportunity for people to synchronize their work. Anybody know why I've got the pictures of the chickens up there? You know why the chickens are up there? There's an old joke you have to know if you want to do anything with Scrum. You have to know this old joke. The joke is that a chicken and a pig are walking down the street when the chicken says, let's start a restaurant. And the pig says, you know, I've always wanted to own a restaurant. That does sound fun, but what would we call the restaurant? And the chicken thinks about it for a moment, and the chicken says, how about ham and eggs? And the pig says, no, thanks. I'd be committed. You'd only be involved. meant to point out the distinction between those who are committed on a project, that, that pig who has to give up his life to be part of the breakfast versus the chicken who only has to lay some eggs right, to be part of the breakfast. So it's meant to point out the distinction between committed and involved. And we have a policy in Scrum where only those who are committed on the project are allowed to talk. Only those who are committed on the project are allowed to talk during this meeting. We invite the whole world. They can all come. But... Those who are not committed, those who are just involved, we don't let them talk. So, for example, your CEO, your, your president of your company, your general manager, that person is probably not committed on the project. Now, they may be the one who makes headlines when, you know, the project is late. That's a little bit different, right? Let's use like a, a Bill Gates before he retired from Microsoft. If Bill Gates had walked down to the Daily Stand-Up, <laughs> the poor Scrum Master would have had to say, sorry, Bill, you're not allowed to talk. Um, I don't know if I would have had the guts to say that to Bill Gates, but uh, the idea being that the committed team members, that's who this meeting is for. Anybody else show up and listen? I've got these chickens with guns because if your chickens show up packing heat, they're allowed to talk. Um, <laughs> during this meeting, what we found is the best way to keep the conversation at the right level, just these three simple questions. Everybody shows up prepared to answer what did you do yesterday? What did you do today? Is anything slowing you down? Anything in your way? And these are not status for the Scrum Master. This is you talking to your team. When I train Scrum Masters, in fact, I'm doing a Scrum Master class next week, one of the things here, one of the things I'll, I'll teach them is to not make eye contact during this meeting. People always want to make eye contact. Right? They'll want to look at somebody to you know, have their focus for a second. And they'll look to the Scrum Master during this meeting. I tell the Scrum Master to be looking at the wall or look at somebody else or look down. Don't make eye contact. If you make eye contact, the person starts giving their report to you. And I want the report to be to the whole team, not just to the Scrum Master. So that's not what this is about. Sprint review. Third of our four meetings. We've had this planning meeting, the daily Scrum, the review. The review is where the team demonstrates what's been built. They show the product owner, here's where we're at. This is meant to be an opportunity to get feedback. Right? The team stops right where they're at, and then they show what they've built. 
They don't spend the next two days getting ready for it. They don't go make a bunch of PowerPoints. No slides. I've got that bullet point up here. No slides. If you want to spend an hour or two cleaning up some test data, something like that, to make sure the demo goes better, I'm fine with that because that's all about maximizing or optimizing the, re the feedback we're going to get. But this is not meant to be some sort of detour. The team doesn't take a detour for two days to get ready for a review and then start the next sprint. This is just a, hey, we finished up yesterday at 5 o'clock. Here's where we're at. And they give the quick review. Right? Typically 30 minutes, maybe an hour. Right? It might go longer in some teams, some really fast teams. A lot of people have come in to look at it. It might go longer in some context. Typical, especially I like two-week sprints, especially with a two-week sprint, 30 to 60 minutes, plenty of time to get some feedback on this. Right? It's only two weeks. How much could we have built in two weeks, even if we're fast? Okay? One of the phrases that we use a lot in Scrum is the phrase inspect and adapt, meaning look at how it's going and make changes. This is the inspect and adapt meeting on the product. Hey, here's what we built. Do you still like it? Are we going the right direction? Yeah, yeah, I love that. In fact, I like what you did here so much. I want you to do more of that over here. Or, you know, no, I don't like what I'm seeing here. Let's go get some customer feedback. Inspect and adapt on the product. Will we also inspect and adapt on the process? How well is Scrum working for us? So one of the things that teams do is a retrospective at the end of every sprint. 15 to 30 minutes, maybe a little bit longer occasionally. 15 to 30 minutes, plenty of time on a regular basis for the team to reflect. Think about how Scrum is working for us and look for things that we can do better. I'll just show you one way I like to do this meeting. I like to do it with what's called a start-stop-continue meeting. What should we start doing that we're not? What should we stop doing that we are? What is wasting us time? And what should we continue doing? What's working well for us that we'd like to continue? So we have the team just shout out some things that we want to start, stop, and continue. Maybe we vote on it, we work on the top two or three things. So this is about improving our use of Scrum as a process. So we inspect and adapt on the product through the review, inspect and adapt on the process through the retrospective. Okay. Let's look at the Scrum artifacts. We're going to come out with a backlog, a sprint product backlog, sprint backlog, and burn down charts. Product backlogs, the features list. The prioritized features list, all the things that we want on a product. That's all this slide is saying. Let me show you an example. So we might have a product backlog in an Excel spreadsheet format, Google spreadsheet, something like that, that looks like this. If we had a travel website, allow a guest to make a reservation. The next couple are written in the form of what we call user stories, which is what my, I think my next session this morning is going to be about. User stories are a great technique for writing product back items. They put the user front and center. They make it more obvious what we're after. Right? These ones may not because these aren't the greatest user stories. They were just short ones to put up there. But a user story is a good technique that Agile teams have found for talking about and collecting requirements. So some of these next few ones are that. Things like, as a hotel employee, I can run a revenue per available room report. Now, that's just a short statement of what we want. There'd be a lot of detail to have to dig into about that. This is a product backlog. Teams typically focus their product backlog around a sprint goal. A sprint goal is a summary of what we're going to try to achieve in a sprint. These are three from uh, real projects I worked on over the last few years. I'll just touch on, uh, let's touch on the first one here. We had a, doing an uh, uh, application in a bioinformatics company, and the company had a wonderful application for doing individual genetics. It could look at Mike Cohn's DNA and do all sorts of fancy graphs and charts and visualizations, analysis. It was great at that. But the company wanted to get into what was known as population genetics. Population genetics would be looking at me, my uncle, my daughter, a cousin, right, my father, and saying, what does the Cohn family have in common? And looking for how genetic markers were getting passed through that family. You can see that's slightly different, perhaps somewhat related application, though. So we set that up as a goal. We wanted to take our existing application and the team that was working on that, set up as their sprint goal, focus on population genetics features. We had that as a goal for the next uh, two or three sprints. I think it was three sprints. So for the next three sprints, every time we had a prioritization or planning meeting, we looked at it and we said, okay, what can help us achieve our goal of getting more population genetics? We had other requests come in, things like improved performance at this area. No, 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 we'll do that later. Right now we're focused on 
population genetic support. Right. This kind of helped the team structure their product backlog because they knew what was the highest level priorities, population genetics in that case. So that was the first artifact is product backlog. Second artifact the team works with is the sprint backlog. Sprint backlog is the team's private to-do list, the list of things they want to do. Right. And individuals sign up for this. This is the third time I've said this. Nobody assigns it to them. Each person picks what they're going to work on. They're meant to keep the, product, the sprint backlog up to date by changing hours in there, estimates in there. So if I worked on something yesterday and it said eight hours, I worked on it all day, maybe I mark it down to three hours. I still got three hours to go. Maybe I worked on it all day and I still have 10 hours to go. I went backwards yesterday. I found out this thing is harder than I thought. So I update the sprint backlog with work remaining. Being the team's private to-do list, they can add or remove things to it any time. I start working on this, uh, whatever this task is, and I realize, well, you know, it's not so much harder than I think it is, but I, we forgot to, uh, we're going to have another part of it. We have to make some database changes. So I can put a new task in the sprint backlog that says make database changes because of whatever I'm doing. Right, so the team can add or remove items to this as they go. Let me show you an example of a sprint backlog. Again, just Excel spreadsheets, most common for many of these, uh, for the artifacts. So let's say we do a planning meeting Monday morning. A couple days from now, we come into the office and we create a sprint backlog showing all the tasks we're going to do that sprint. And we put some estimates on there. These are in hours, so I think it's like eight hours to code the user interface. The next day, we update that. Every day, teams have to update this. I use blank to represent zero. I find it more readable. So what I'm showing there is write online help went from 12 to zero. It's done. Code the user interface, four hours left. I don't know if I worked all night. Maybe I stayed here all night and I have four hours to go. Maybe I worked on it for 15 minutes and I'm down to four hours. So this is effort remaining. Now watch what happens on the last day. I add a row. We forgot a task. All right, so we add it in here. And then Thursday and Friday, finishing that up. Okay. So sprint backlog, list of work that we have to do during the sprint. Another artifact. Sprint burn down chart. Sprint burn down chart is meant to show the number of hours left in a sprint. So I'm showing the hours over the days. This was a team in Sacramento, California. They walked out of their sprint planning meeting thinking they had 780 hours to go. That was what they committed to. You'll notice it burned up a little bit. And then uh, a little hard to see the laser here, but over here, they dropped some work. They realized, uh oh, we've committed to too much. They went to their product owner, asked about it, and agreed to drop some work so that they could finish by the end of the sprint date. Okay. I just want to show you how one of these is created, um, because this is such an easy thing, but I find that it doesn't happen often enough. It should just take a minute a day. Team has a, pr a sprint backlog. Every day, the scrum master adds up the number of hours on that sprint backlog and puts another dot on the burndown chart. So all the scrum master has to do is to look at the, uh, if these are, a lot of times teams will write this on the wall, Scrum Master will have to add up the tasks that are on the wall. It might be in an Excel spreadsheet, in which case all this happens automatically. If you're using an automated tool, there's a variety of tools out there for doing this. Teams will just get this out of a tool. But this is just something that's once a day, and this is not a micromanagement technique for the boss to manage a team. This is a micromanagement technique, if you want to call it that, but it's for the team managing themselves. The team uses this to look at and see, have we committed to too much, maybe not enough. All right, so once a day, the team updates their sprint burndown chart. Will not take them long to do. I think the last thing I want to talk about here is scalability, just to show that Scrum does scale. I've worked on Scrum teams with 560 people. That's the biggest one that I was a day-to-day -day contributor on. But I've worked, um, I've consulted to three teams over a thousand. So Scrum team scales up quite a bit. We talked about the typical two pizza team. Um, in scaling Scrum. We're going to look at things like you know, the type of team, uh, the application, how long the project is going. Well, one of the biggest mechanisms is we're going to scale up through that daily scrum meeting. So imagine each of these teams off doing their daily stand-up. I've got a blue team, a green team, and a red team doing their daily stand-ups. I want those teams to talk, though, occasionally. So I'm going to pull one person from each of those teams, keep them on those teams. I kept them on the teams. They're dimmed out a little bit to show they're still there but they're also on 
the second group that gets together and just talks occasionally. They might get together three times a week and hold what they call a scrum of scrums meetings. All right, so we got daily scrums, scrum of scrums. And they talk about coordination issues. The other thing that we typically do is scale up through establishing communities of practice. So suppose these are my scrum teams. I've got three scrum teams oriented here. Well, on a large project, I want to make sure that programmers are talking across the teams. I came across this when I was working with a uh, video game company. Um, we were doing the sprint review. Sprint reviews of video game companies are fun. They consist of playing the game. So we're doing the review. We're playing the game, and we notice the bad guys attack us differently on level three than they do on level four. They're the same bad guys, but they gang up on us a little differently. And we asked the artificial intelligence programmers who code that behavior, why? And they said, well, because they're on another team. We don't talk to them. It's like, you guys are all AI programmers. You're all artificial intelligence programmers. You don't talk? No, we didn't think we were allowed to talk to anybody outside of our scrum team. Like, wow, there was a misperception, right? So we fixed that by making sure we had these communities of practice cutting across our scrum teams. So if I've got scrum teams like this, I might... Say, I want the programmers talking. I want the testers talking. Some of these have formal managers who get these groups together. Other times, it's just uh, make sure they know they should get together, and they'll do it. Right? So different levels of community of practice. Right? And these cut across our scrum teams. <coughs> Here's a list of um, good books on scrum. Again, you'll be able to get this on my website. I don't know if they pass the slides out here at all. Um, good books on Scrum. Um, a comment on this presentation. Um, back in 2002, there were a ton of people saying, hey, I have to make a 90-minute presentation for my team. And um, anybody say just what it should contain. And all these messages all over the place about this. And decided, oh, screw it. I've already got a presentation like this. And I posted mine in PowerPoint format on my website. Um, it's been updated. That's what, mostly what I just went through. I think I changed one or two things, but that was it. So this presentation is up on my website in Keynote, which is Mac and PowerPoint format. It's been translated. I don't think anybody's done it in Norwegian yet, so we need one of you to help us out with that. But it's in all sorts of other languages. Um, so if you're looking to introduce Scrum back to your team, go grab this presentation off the website. It's, uh, you know, it's in PowerPoint and Keynote, so it's very easily usable and extendable. Um, I'm here all day. Hopefully we've got a couple of you coming back for other sessions I'm doing. I've got user story session next. S-Main planning, self-organizing teams, and prioritizing sessions later. I also teach classes here through our host program up at Clean, so I'll just flash those up there. Um, here's my contact information. Um, email me anytime. Hard to reach by phone, let alone the eight-hour time zone difference, but um, easy to get by email. I always answer emails on this stuff, um, or find me during the, the breaks today. Um, we're right at the end, so I'm just gonna, I am going to let us end right now. But anybody that's got questions, I'm not going anywhere. Um, question first, yeah? Yeah. And each sprint item has uh, estimates yep. and work remaining. But why don't we include actual time spent for that task? So the question is why don't we include actual time on the task? Um, I would love to have that information if I could get it by doing something like embedding an RFID chip in people, you know, and, and know what they were typing. Um, but when we tell people that I'm going to track their actual time expended. It introduces a lot of dysfunctionalities into their behavior. People will say, uh-oh, they're going to be tracking my time. I think this is going to take me 10 hours. Let me tell them 20 so that it looks good when I burn it down. And the teams, I, I've tested this theory um, with maybe 20 teams by now. Teams that track actuals, if I look at their burn down charts, very rarely do we ever see any increases in the burn down charts because people are kind of feeding out their estimate using that pad. Teams that don't track estimates are much more likely to seem realistic because I will see variability in their burn down chart. I will see it occasionally get worse. Um, and so while I'd love to have that information, what I find is it introduces a little bit of dysfunctionality. People worry that they're being tracked by that. Um, so as much as I'd like it, it just introduces dysfunctionalities. So let's call it officially over so you can guys get to your next session. But anybody who does have questions, hang around. Ask me questions as long as you want, because I'm not going anywhere until the next session starts. So thank you very much.